Hello, everyone. We're back. I hope you had an opportunity to network, um, get to meet some new people. Uh, I truly believe that there's a lot of overlap where domestic violence is concerned. You have people that are very passionate about um, helping victims, uh, helping survivors, um, and oftentimes the first thing they think of is, I'm going to start a nonprofit. Um, what I would encourage everyone to do is look at what the resources are that are out there and um, see where there are gaps, where you can fill the space. And our next speaker ha has a very unique position. Um, he is, I say he's an educator because he is now educating people, unfortunately, on his forced life experiences. Um, so our next speaker is Bill Mitchell. He wrote a book, When Dating Hurts, and we're going to learn all about that very soon. So, Bill. So I'm Bill Mitchell. I wrote and published the book you see on your screen there, When Dating Hurts, came out in May. And it's a tough book to, uh, to write, tough book for people to read, I'm told. But it tells the story of our daughter Kristen's murder uh, by her ex boyfriend back in uh, in June of 2005. And what I want to talk about are the signs parents and friends should not ignore, because in every unhealthy relationship, there are signs, there are warning signs or red flags that if you know about them, you can pick up on them. And if you pick up on them, you might be able to help the person who's in that unhealthy relationship, that person that's being abused. So that's what I want to talk about. I'm talking about those things we did not know about because they're so doggone important. These are photos from Kristen's college graduation on May 14th, 2005. And uh, you can see in those pictures that she was never, never more, I think, radiant or proud, excited, happy, ready to take off in life. Never more so than, than that day, I think. Uh, you can see it throughout. The picture in the upper left is Kristen with her mom, Michelle. Bottom left is with her good friend, Samantha. Uh, they're just great, great buddies, great pals. But, you know, you can see for yourself that uh, she was a happy young lady. And then just a couple more pictures. The one on the left there is our family of four, my son, David. Then Kristen, then my wife, Michelle, and I, and on the right, Kristen and David. Now, that picture on the left is actually, that's the last picture taken of our family of four. And the great irony of that picture is that it was taken by the man who would destroy that My wife had a conversation with Kristen a couple of weeks before that. and was just kind of talking about this boyfriend she had been dating most of that year. And it said at some point, well, you know, tell me about it. And Kristen just said, well, mom, it's not the perfect relationship. And that conversation wasn't pursued that much more than that. I think my wife felt as I would have felt if I had heard that, that Whatever this was, was probably winding down. It wasn't going to last very much longer. Kristen obviously had dated other guys. She'll date guys in the future. And this guy was just kind of like, you know, just not doing it one way or another. So it just wasn't the perfect relationship. And here, Kristen was graduating. She had a job lined up already with General Mills. I mean, she was really blasting off. The other thing is that that day, probably just minutes before that picture on the left was taken, when I met this guy, it was for the very first time. This is the first time our family met him. And when I saw him, I met him, I shook his hand. I had the strangest thought occur to me. And that was, wow, I wouldn't want to tangle with this guy. I don't think of, I can't think of anybody in my entire life that I thought about fighting somebody. And it wasn't just being protective. I just felt there was something off, but I didn't pursue that either. Now, 
these pictures represent shots between the graduation day and as it says on the screen there, June 2nd, 2005. Uh, but you see various pictures, you see what, really what a lovely young lady she was. Very happy, she had great friends who she you know, would carry into the future. She had a job, as I mentioned, with General Mills. She had a new apartment she moved into. And the picture at the top there in the kitchen is she was working on kind of a cheese potato soup and that was only really days before she was killed, but she's very happy, had a picture taken of it, uh, wanted to show mom and dad, look, I'm using the new apartment, I'm using this new kitchen. But uh, the only thing that was not positive in her life turned out to be the boyfriend that I spoke about earlier. He was later uh, by Kristen's friends and, and by some things we had seen that she had written, he was said to be difficult, he was controlling, he was manipulative, uh, he was extremely jealous, and he was extremely jealous of Kristen's time with, with her family, specifically her mother, and then all of her friends. I mean, and jealousy like that usually then winds up turning into isolation, doing her best to isolate her from, from all these other people. And they'd broken up a couple of times here and there but he always managed to find his way to kind of worm his way back into the relationship. But anyway, on June 2nd, she was trying to see a couple of, uh, of guys that she graduated with from St. Joseph's University, where she went in Philadelphia. And uh, by the way, we live just outside of Baltimore, so we're 125 miles apart at that time. But she wanted to see these two guys. She, she had taken business classes with them. She had done projects with them. <clears throat> she did all kinds of things. We even have a kind of a practice interview that she was doing with one of the guys. We still have that tape and uh, it's very precious. But one of the guys was going to be taking a job in Texas and the other guy was heading off to New York soon. And Kristen was going to be with General Mills in the Philadelphia area, but she knew that uh, the opportunities to see these guys were limited and winding down. So on that day, June 2nd, she spent th just about the entire day with those two guys. And her boyfriend, Nick, was not very happy about it. He, he had made it known, but she said, look, I have to do this. These guys are gonna be moving away. And although Nick knew it was completely platonic with these guys, he was very bothered by this. Now, Kristen met up with these two guys who were friends. They went to a, uh, a, a restaurant that afternoon, went to lunch. She went with one of the, the other, one of the guys had to go off to a job he had, part-time job uh, in the area before his big job from school. But with the other guy, uh, he went, she went off with him and uh, went to a pool with him and his girlfriend and just enjoyed some time in the sun that day. And then met up with the two guys again in the evening for dinner. And then after that, actually watched a movie in her apartment. But intermixed into all of that was this Nick fellow and was constantly texting her, calling her, bothering her, trying to find ways to get in, try to find ways to break up what was going on, insinuating there was more going on than, than she said. So uh, that particular day, he was jealous of her spending the day with their friends. And in, he kept interrupting, as I said, he was even lying about his whereabouts because he was frustrated about wanting to get to her, but then was spending some time with the girlfriend he had had before Kristen. None of that was known to her, of course, but just becoming more amped up, more angry as time went on that particular day, just furious. Quite a long email here, which I'm not going to read, but you see that this is at the end of that day, June 2nd, I've been talking about, at 11.33 in the evening. Now, Kristen and I passed back and forth three emails that day. She wrote to me, I wrote her back. She wrote to me, I wrote her back, and she wrote to me. But this is the third of her three, or the, excuse me, the second of the three. 11.33, so the day's almost over. 
and I won't read it all. Now, I blocked out some of these because I blocked out the real names of all the people just for privacy. I'll come out and say Nick was not this guy's real name, but it's the name I use in my book and it's the name I, I use here. Um, and the other two guys, I blocked them out because they're just not, you don't need to know really. But what I want to do is this is a, an email where Kristen had kind of made the turn about talking about Nick and the and what she was putting up with him that day. So to make it easy, I just want to draw attention to seven areas that you could call, and I didn't know at the time, but you could call warning signs that I didn't know anything about. I just thought he's difficult. Once again, this is not the perfect relationship. It's going to come to an end. Don't worry about it. But I point out in here, acting really jealous. He was acting really jealous because she hung out with her friends. He kept calling and not trusting her all day. Really annoying. Acting really mad. And, um, you know, it was a hard thing to do, but I had to tell him I needed space. So you can see this relationship as far as she was concerned was kind of suffocating in some ways. Uh, later on says he was, he seems to be getting more and more controlling, classic warning sign. When I'll go over a list of warning signs in a moment, not giving me space to be me, she talks about again. So there's seven right there at least. So, you know, being dad, uh, I read that as it turns out, not long after I was getting ready to turn in <clears throat> at that time, I had to go to work the next day. This was uh Thursday going now into Friday at uh, just past midnight when I pushed send on this one. So I said, I'll hold off on getting sleep. But the key points in this one go like this, that I was being the nice dad and I didn't know what the relationship was like. I didn't push her about that. I didn't really see anything from the last email that, that made me think that danger was ahead. But I say on here, you need to reassure him that he's important to you, but your friends are important too. They're not more important than he, but they're a part of your life. And I say he needs to hear and understand that you have friends. It doesn't mean you like him any less. And then lastly, I finish, just be honest with Nick and it should work out, love dad. And soon after that, I went off to bed. Two and a half hours passed. She had finished watching this movie, which was called Open Water. It's kind of like, as Kristen was trying to point out, it was a rather disappointing movie. Uh, it's some shark movie, as it turns out. Evidently, it was rather lame. But she puts on here, although it was pretty disappointing, the movie, it was good to continue to spend time with friends who care about me and not give in to a jealous acting guy. And uh, so uh, that was supposed to be it. She was supposed to be calling it a night, as she say, you know, going to bed herself. But as it turns out, after she hit send on that email, there were more text messages and calls, and she didn't turn in quite yet. Now I'm gonna pause that story for a moment, and I wanna go into these warning signs which is really the main purpose of us talking. The warning signs of an unhealthy relationship, and there are many, but I wanna point out some of the key ones. For instance, constant put downs. It's supposed to be a loving relationship, and yet there can be constant put downs. There can be nicknames that are not very appealing uh, that keep coming back. It could be putting somebody down about, about the way they look, even though, again, this is supposed to be some kind of a relationship or some version of partnership, but constant put downs about the way somebody looks, the way they do her hair, maybe the way she dresses, maybe about her friends, maybe about her family members, but kind of making it known that I'm better than you. And so therefore I have permission to say to you whatever I want to say to you. As you could see in some of Kristen's writing, controlling her dominant behavior, always trying to insert himself checking uh, someone's cell phone or email without their permission. Uh, you know, that's somebody who you leave the room and when you come back, they've got your cell phone and they're checking your text messages or emails or whatever that is. 
And I know for a fact from Kristen's friends that he did that type of things, those things with her or to her. Extreme jealousy. She talks in her last email to me, the last email ever written in her life, this uh, jealous acting guy. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, we all know what possessiveness feels like when we've had it happen to ourselves as well. Isolating you from family and friends. This guy did this all the time. Um, you saw the graduation picture of the four of us. My son and I actually headed back to Baltimore where we live, but my wife and Kristen headed to the Maryland beach and were there a few days. And, uh, and he was constantly texting and calling Kristen and then even coerced her by making, beginning to make a meal back in the Philadelphia area and saying, look, you know, I got the table laid out. I bought all these things. Look at these flowers. I mean, you are coming home, aren't you? You're coming home tonight, right? And so Kristen felt the need to cut her time with her mother short. Another version of isolation. Explosive temper. You know, what happens dealing with somebody like that? Kristen talks about him acting mad. But somebody who uh, is like that is someone that you don't want that to happen. So you give in, give in, give in, even at times when you wouldn't do that, maybe with other people in your life. Constantly checking up on you uh, with calls and texts. We talked about making you feel no one else would ever want you. That one makes sense, too, under the heading of power and control, right? Uh, it's kind of like, um, hey, you know, you're not so great, but I'm with you. But I, I had to tell you something, or I have to remind you that, uh, you know, I could go in any minute and you're lucky I'm even around. Making you feel you can't do anything right, which takes us into an area called gaslighting. Uh, and I won't go to the origin of that, but <clears throat> gaslighting is, is that. It's, it's finding every fault you make and amplifying it. Um, it's somebody who even in some cases, I had this happen to a cousin, uh, who was married, whose husband actually went out of his way to actually alter things around the house so that she would find things out of place. She would say, wow, what happened? I mean, I, I put out the vitamins for last night. I put out the vitamins for today. They're not here. And he'd say, well, obviously you never put them out. And she thought she was losing her mind. And that was fine with him. And uh, then she started to try her own version of testing things and all of that and found out that that's one of the many things he was up to. These last two kind of go together, always telling you what to do and then preventing you from doing what you want to do. You like to play tennis, he'll tell you that's a stupid sport. Uh, Kristen loved to ride horses. You know, he would try to make sure that uh, she didn't do that because that takes time away from him. So those are kind of a, a, a good, strong uh, a, a version of the classic warning signs of an unhealthy relationship. And now you know what some of those are, but I can tell you that Kristen didn't know and she had no idea, nor did her friends, nor did her family know the potential danger she was heading to. After Kristen's last email to me, she was back in contact with Nick with texts and calls as best as we can ascertain. And all that, and although that she was annoyed with him as she expressed, she did allow him to come back into her apartment. Anyway, most of that June day passed. And then in the rainy evening of that day, that same day, many hours later, I got a call from police detectives, local police detectives. Now, again, I live outside of Baltimore. This happened around Philly. And when these detectives met up with me, they, they uh, said, well, what they said over the phone was, we can't tell you what happened or we can't talk about why we need to meet with you unless we do it in person. And I, uh, I had no idea what they were going to come and tell me, you know, in a rainy evening on a Friday. But what they told me was a parent's worst nightmare. And I took a picture soon after my back was practically up against that Gatorade when, uh, when the two detectives showed up and told me what they had to tell me. As you can imagine, the following week was just dizzying. It was uh, a 24-hour nightmare. 
um, interviewing and visiting funeral homes and cemeteries, um, making friends to uh, making calls to friends, getting calls from friends, family members, um, speaking with people at the apartment complex, lots of calls with police out of Philly. And of course, the wake, the funeral service, reception, all of that. Kristen didn't know what to look for. And Kristen's friends didn't know what to look for. And one of her teachers who talked with her that week before the graduation asked about, you know, what else have you got going on? You got this great job. And she said, well, I have a boyfriend. It's kind of difficult kind of problems, but I can handle it. And her parents didn't know what to look for. My wife and I didn't know what to look for. But the idea is that now you know what to look for. You know, my daughter, Kristen, and her friends learned in the worst possible way what to look for. And we've been dealing with it for now for the last 15 years. I want to kind of close here with a couple quick things. One of them is there is only one statistic I ever used in the book and that I ever use when I give speeches, and I've given well over 100 of those. And so I just want to share it with you. It's very easy to remember, but I want to talk about the prominence of the physical violence that takes place in unhealthy relationships. It's this one. One in three women will suffer serious physical violence in an intimate partner relationship. That's a lot of people. And typically it happens between the ages of 16 and 24. But I've met people who were 12 years old who've had it happen some high school freshmen. And I've met women in their 50s who've talked to me in my speeches, who've had it happen just within days of talking to me. It's a very serious problem. And for that reason, knowing these warning signs can be tips so that you can work with others and help these people get real life professional help. So that's really why I wanted to, to do this today. I, I met a man a couple of years ago. He worked for a printing company. And uh, I told him my story. And I told him this statistic. And he said, I've got to sit down. It's like he was going to pass out. I said, what's the problem? And he said, I have quadruplets at home. They're entering college next year. My daughter's are entering college next year. And you're telling me one in three women have this happen. I have four daughters. My book is a cautionary tale and the information in here has already saved lives. I know that. In fact, if you read my book, you'll actually run into some people who came up to me and told me that. Besides our story, you will find the warning signs we talked about today. And they're the signs that friends Parents and friends should not ignore, and you'll come into a, a lot more than that kind of information. There's also what I call the template that all abusers follow, and I've tested that template out on people who've been abused, and they say, wow, this is exactly the way it goes, and it's a template. It's only five steps in it, and it just repeats and repeats and repeats to those who are abused, so you'll find those things and much more. And uh, my last slide is just to thank you for listening. Thanks again to Sherry and everybody for putting this together today. I have my copy and I have to say, first of all, thank you so much that your story is so powerful. Um, thank you. And it is a cautionary tale. Um, I, my copy is dog-eared and bookmarked, and it took me two days to read it. I understand it takes some people a day to read it, but, um, you know, coming from a survivor perspective, uh, I got to a certain point and just had to put it down and take a walk. <laughs> yeah, you're not, you're not the only one. You're yeah. not the only one. A lot of people said that. Yes. So um, this, uh, a link to um, his website where you can get more information um, and a link to buy the book is uh, on the resources that you'll get after the event. So thank you so much, Bill. Yes, thanks for this opportunity. This is great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody.